Hello, Hoosiers. Thank you so much. Well, please, everybody, everybody have a seat. Have a seat. Uh, let me begin by saying thank you to Mayor Ballard for that introduction, uh, for all the great work you're doing for the people of Indianapolis, uh, and for your service as a Marine. Uh, we are very proud of the partnership that we've had uh, with this city. Uh, I also want to recognize uh, Ivy Tech Chancellor uh, Kathleen Lee and President Tom Schneider. Where are they? Right here. They're all here. Some outstanding members of Congress. Joe Donnelly, our Senator. Where's Joe? There he is. Congressman Andre Carson. Uh, and somebody who has been uh, a great friend uh, for the people of this state, the people of this nation, a great friend to me personally, uh, one of the people who have ensured that America is safe uh, for so many years, uh, former Senator and Mayor of Indianapolis, Dick Luger. So. On, on the way over here, Dick and I were reminiscing about uh, the first foreign trip I ever took uh, was with Dick Luger. He was uh, the, the savvy veteran. I was the, the green behind the ears freshman. Uh, we went to Russia. We were both interested in nuclear proliferation. He had really written the book on it. Um, and uh, Dick Luger seems like a kind of a relaxed guy, but if you're on a trip with him, he will wear you out. <laughs> And, uh, and then at one point, we were actually held by uh, a Russian colonel at the airport for about three hours, uh, which normally might have made people nervous. But Dick, you know, he'd been around the block a few times, so he just took a nap. <laughs> it was fine. It got cleared up. Um, it is great to be back in Indiana, uh, great to be back close to my home state. Uh, I respect the Pacers. Um, but yes, I am a Bulls fan. I make no apologies. We've had some fierce, fierce rivalries in the past. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, Mr. George and others getting back on track so we can have uh, some more playoff runs. Um, but that's not all that I know about this state. Uh, one of my first trips uh, as president uh, was to Elkhart. And I stopped by. Stop by some of your manufacturing plants. Uh, I've played three on three uh, at a school up in Kokomo, uh, and my team won, by the way. <laughs> uh, when it comes to elections, I'm, I'm batting 500. I'm one for two, uh, which isn't bad. Uh, last time, I, I will acknowledge the last time I, I got kind of smoked here in Indiana. Uh, but, but that's okay. That's exactly why uh, I want to come back. Uh, and I don't plan to, to take too long in the front because I want to make sure that we've got some time for questions. But, you know, when I gave my State of the, of the Union address a couple of weeks ago, I repeated a vision that I originally laid out in Boston uh, over a decade ago. Uh, and that's a vision that says there is no liberal America or conservative America. There's the United States of America. Uh, and I know that Sometimes it seems like our politics are more divided than ever, uh, that in parts of Indiana, the only blue you'll ever see is uh, on Colt signs. Uh, and in Chicago, the only red is for the Chicago Bulls. Uh, but I still believe what I said back then, uh, that you know, we actually have so much more in common than not. Uh, it doesn't always get focused on in our politics. And I've seen so much of the good, generous, big-hearted optimism of people across the country these past uh, six years to, to give in to the cynicism that sometimes gets peddled as, as wisdom uh, around the country. And we've come a long way these past six years uh, since we suffered the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Now, this morning we found out that America's businesses added another 267,000 <laughs> jobs. Um, 
In 2014, our economy created more than 3.1 million jobs, and that's the best year of job growth since the 1990s. So all told, over the past 59 months, the private sector has added about 11 million, 0.8, so that's uh, you know, almost 12 million new jobs. And that's the longest uh, streak of private sector job growth in our history. Meanwhile, our deficits are shrinking. They've gone down by about two-thirds. Our dropout rates are down. Our graduation rates are up. Uh, we're as free of foreign oil as we've been in 30 years. We're, we've doubled the amount of clean energy that we're producing. Uh, a lot of families are saving a lot of money uh, at the gas pump, which is putting some smiles on folks' faces. Uh, and, <laughs> no, you're welcome. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, although I was telling somebody the other day, at some point they're going to go back up, so don't start, <laughs> you know, going out there and ignoring, you know, the mileage on, uh, on uh, when you're buying a new car. You know, so you got to keep looking for, for those savings. Uh, and in the single most hopeful sign for middle class families, wages are starting to go up again. And so, so America is poised for another good, good year. Indianapolis is poised for another good year. As long as Washington works to keep this progress going. And I was struck as I was listening to the mayor's uh, introduction you know, here in Indiana, we've been able to do some good things because we haven't been so worried about Democrat, Republican, and we've focused more on trying to get the job done. And that attitude, we're hoping to kind of infect Washington with, try to try to adapt that same attitude when it comes to the problems that we face going forward. And, and Dick Luger was a great example of that. You know, we have written. Uh, or, or we, we have risen from recession freer to write our own future than any nation on earth. But we've got to make some decisions about what that future looks like. Are we going to be a nation where a few of us do spectacularly well and everybody else is struggling to get by? Or are we going to have a country in which everybody has opportunity? Everybody's got a chance to succeed. Last year, you know, I got a letter from uh, Jillian Milham, uh, who lives up in Fishers. Uh, where's Jillian? There she is, right there, right in front. And Jillian's got four kids, ages 6 through 16, uh, which means that, you know, she's busy. <laughs> For 13 years, Jillian was a, a stay-home mom. A few years ago, she was going through a divorce, had to find a way to support her family. She didn't have a college degree. Uh, most of the jobs that she could find paid minimum wage. As she put it, uh, I was a mom with four kids and I had everything coming against me. So Jillian came here to Ivy Tech to invest in herself, to learn new skills. Uh, she paid her way with the help of a grant from her country and a grant from the state of Indiana. She made the dean's list, earned a spot in the radiography uh, program at IUPUI. <laughs> and that's a profession that pays pretty well. And today, she's a few months from graduating. She's ready to get started on a new career. And really proud. And, you know, in the letter she wrote, she, she said, you know, it's, it's not just uh, the possibility of, of financial security and career advancement. She said, it's also something I can show my children. You know, it's, it's, it's about pride, and it's about uh, being able to point to a brighter future for the next generation. And that's who I get up for every single day. You know, sometimes people ask me, Mr. President, your, your hair is so gray. <laughs> yeah, you know, folks are always talking about you, not always in the most flattering way. How do, you, how, how do you do it? Well, the reason is folks like Jillian, you know, who, who are 
are out there all across Indiana, all across the country. They're working so hard, doing the right thing, not asking for a handout. They just want to make sure that if they are putting in the effort and they're meeting their responsibilities, that they can get ahead. And, and, and we can't do it for them, but we can help. We can create structures of opportunity like we have here at Ivy Tech. That's something we can do for everybody. And that's what keeps me going. Now, I want to make sure that this is a country where hard work is rewarded and you get a chance to make a decent living. And, and that's what I've been calling middle class economics is all about. Uh, the idea that in this country, everybody does best when everybody's doing their fair share and everybody's got a fair shot and everybody's playing by the same set of rules. You know, we live in a time of constant change, and technology's made some jobs obsolete. Global competition has shipped some jobs overseas. It's tougher to afford economic necessities like childcare or healthcare. And that's been true since long before the financial crisis hit back in 2007, 2008. Uh, and that's why at a time when the economy is finally picking up steam and growing again, we've got to work twice as hard, especially in Washington, to help more Americans like Jillian. So this week I sent Congress a budget that's built on this idea of eco uh, middle class economics for the 21st century. It means helping middle class families afford child care and health care, making it a little easier to pay for college without taking on loads of debt, paid leave at work, helping first-time home buyers, helping people save for retirement. And my budget addresses each of these issues, and it could put thousands of dollars back in the pockets of hard-working middle-class families. <laughs> middle-class economics also means helping more people like Jillian upgrade their skills, because this competitive economy is not going to get easier. You know, folks just aren't going to be in the same job for 30 years. These young people who are here today, they're going to have a bunch of different jobs. And they're going to be, there's going to be the need for you to continually upgrade your skills. It's all about lifelong learning now, not just a one-time deal. So that's why my budget makes two years of community college free for every responsible student. For every responsible student. Because here in America, it shouldn't matter how much money your folks make. If you're willing to work hard, you should be able to get that opportunity. And you shouldn't necessarily have $100,000 worth of debt when you leave, especially if you're going to go into a profession like teaching. Or and we're not just working to make community colleges free, uh, like Ivy Tech, we want to make our community colleges even better and more responsive uh, and more attuned to what's going on in the marketplace. Right here at this school, one of the best in the country, not just in the state of Indiana. Um, <laughs> you're finding ways to raise graduation rates, and partner with businesses to help provide apprenticeships and other pathways to careers that pay well in fields like construction and technology. Middle class economics also means that we're investing in what makes our economy grow. Better roads, faster internet, cutting edge research so that our businesses are creating high paying jobs. And the good news is we can actually afford to pay for all this. We don't have to add to our deficits if we've got some smart spending cuts and if we fix a tax code that is filled up with special interest loopholes and kickbacks for folks who don't need them. You know, and, and in my budget, I, I identify some of these. There's a trust fund loophole that allows the wealthiest 1% of Americans who have benefited more over the last 20 years than anybody from when the economy has been growing. Uh, but it'll, this, this trust fund loophole allows 
the top 1% of Americans to avoid paying taxes on their unearned income. You know, that's not something that Jillian, when she gets her job, uh, is going to be able to do. The majority of people here can't avoid paying taxes. I don't know why the folks who are most able to pay them should be able to avoid it. So we need to fix that. And then we can use the savings to cut taxes for middle class families who really need it. You know, we know, we know that there are companies that have stashed about $2 trillion overseas that haven't paid U.S. taxes. Let's close those loopholes, make it more attractive for businesses to locate here in the United States of America. Let's give those folks a tax break. They'll create jobs right here in Indianapolis, right here in Indiana, as opposed to giving tax breaks to folks that are shipping jobs overseas or parking money overseas. We can do that. So these, these, these are ideas that are pretty common sense. Now, uh, in Washington, uh, folks saw the budget. They said, well, these are Obama's plans. Some of them are pretty good ideas, but they're never going to go anyplace because the Republicans control Congress and they're not going to do it. Well, you know, I'm not pushing these ideas for my sake. I'm pushing them because I think this is where America needs to go. And we should have a, a healthy debate about how to do the things that are necessary to help America grow. You know, Republicans and Democrats won't agree on everything, and that's fine. But we should agree on the stuff we're talking about now. We should agree that hardworking families should be able to get child care that's not more expensive than sending a kid to college. We should agree that somebody like Jillian, who wants to better herself, uh, should be able to go to college without being loaded up with even more debt. We should be willing to agree that a, a great city like Indianapolis needs to keep its infrastructure in good shape in order to attract new businesses so they feel confident that they can get their products and services out to market and that we've got the best trained workforce in the world because that's what's going to make companies want to locate here. Those are things we can agree on. We should agree that the tax code should be fair and nobody should be treated better just because they got better accountants or better lawyers. So if Republicans disagree with the way I'm trying to solve these problems, they should put forward their own plans and I am happy to look at it. But what we can't do is ignore the problems and pretend that they don't matter. Pretend that families aren't out there struggling, doing their best. Um, you know, I, I believe in a crazy thing Dick Ruger once wrote. Uh, Dick said, the other party is also patriotic and may have good ideas. <laughs> That's shocking. Uh, so, you know, I know Mayor Ballard believes the same thing, and, and, and certainly I do. So let's, let's roll up our sleeves, work together, and try to get some stuff done. That's what all of you elected us to do. Not to turn everything into a Washington food fight. Not to just refight the old partisan battles. Let's have a debate that's worthy of this country and build on an economy that is picking up steam and make sure that it is serving everybody. That prosperity is broad-based. That not only everybody is sharing in America's success, but everybody's contributing to America's success. That's what we're trying to do. So that's what's on my mind. Now I want to hear what's on your mind. All right? Um, so we're going to start taking some questions. And the way this is going to work is really simple. You raise your hand. I will call on you. And uh, if you could stand up, introduce yourself, try to keep your question relatively short. I'll try to keep my answer relatively short. Um, in fact, the only rule I'm going to impose is I'm going to go uh, girl boy, girl boy, to make sure it's even. <laughs> make sure it's fair. All right? Okay, let's get started. Who wants to go first? This young lady right here. Hi, I'm Erica Walsh with the College Democrats of Indiana. Um, I was curious how you think 
offering two year free community college will impact universities uh, with traditional four years college? Well, I think a lot of folks are going to still use uh, the traditional pathway of going to a four year university. Um, and and if you if that's your best option, God bless you. That's great. There's always going to be a market for Indiana University or Notre Dame. It's not like suddenly people are going to stop wanting to go there. But what the two years of free community college potentially does is for somebody who's cash strapped, their best option may be let me go get two years in a community college. I may have already at that point gotten the training I need to go out into the workforce and get a good paying job. Or if I decide that I want to continue with my education, I can now transfer to a four-year institution with those credits, which means that the amount of tuition I'm paying at the four-year university is going to be reduced. Either way, you are saving money. And this is part of what we need to do to, to be more creative about how do young people get the skills they need without spending as much money or taking on as much debt. This isn't the only uh, kind of thing we're looking at. For example, uh, and I think Ivy Tech is looking at, at uh, this kind of partnership with high schools. A, a number of community colleges now are linking up with high schools where you can start taking college credits in high school so that by the time you get to the community college, you've already got some credits, which reduces the amount of time that you have to spend in the community college, and that'll save you money too. So the point is, is that we have this very rigid system. We have this image in our heads. Okay, you go through high school, and then right away you go to a four-year university. And instead, what, what we should be thinking about is how do we create from the time you are in ninth grade all the way until the time that you've got a job, how do we make sure you're able to get the best skills possible at the cheapest cost? And if there are faster pathways to do that, let's use those faster pathways. If there are cheaper ways to do that, let's find ways to, to, to reduce cost. Let's use technology in some cases. I mean, online learning is getting better and better and better. And are there ways in which, particularly, say, somebody who's uh, a mom and has an irregular schedule and, and can't be on a campus all day, are, are there ways that she can get some credits while still looking after a family or working part time? So we just have to be much more creative about these issues. The one thing that in addition to being creative, we have to remember is that state legislators have a responsibility to make sure that state institutions are still getting the support that they need because part of what's happened, <laughs> part of the reason that uh, the cost of higher education has gone up so rapidly is that state support for those institutions has gone down or not kept up with inflation. So what happens is then school administrators have to make up for it with higher tuition. Now, the school administrators, they have a responsibility to, to be more efficient. And students and parents, we have a responsibility to be smart consumers. And I, 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 I joked with uh, Malia and Sasha, because Malia's now at the age where she's starting to look at colleges. And I said, you know, these days I hear everybody's looking for fancy gyms and gourmet food and, <laughs> you know, really spiffy dorms. And let me tell you, when I, when I was at college, you know, we, we, college I started at, Occidental College, uh, you know, it, it did have a gym, but, but like the weight room was, you know, it was like a medicine ball. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you had, you had like, I mean, it, it wasn't fancy. It wasn't state of the art. Cafeteria, I don't remember some, some of the stuff they served there, but I remember it wasn't that appetizing. Uh, I do know there was something on the menu that we, 
we called roast beast because we couldn't really we couldn't really tell what kind of meat it was. It was some sort of meat product. Uh, <laughs> so students and parents have to be better consumers. The universities have to figure out how to become more efficient and, and also give information to young people ahead of time because part of what happens these days is in recruiting students, they'll say, don't worry about it. You'll be able to afford it. Well, it's true that in part because we've expanded Pell Grants and uh, we cut out the bank middleman on student loans so that we give more student loans, that a lot of young people are able to finance college that they couldn't do before. But if they don't know ahead of time that when you get out, you may have a sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar bill, then that's a problem. So we got to provide them better information. But ultimately. What also has to happen is state legislators have to step up. The federal government will do its part. And we've expanded the support we're giving to students. But these public institutions have a special obligation, and it is a good investment. Because the states with the best educational system, that's where companies are going to go. It's true not just in this country. It's true all across the world. All right? OK. Uh, it's a gentleman's turn. This young man right here, white shirt. I'm not sure we got a mic back here, but how loud are you? Are you able to just shout? No? All right, it's kind of a soft-spoken guy. Here we go. Um, hi, I'm Mario Kaivman, an ASAP student here at Ivy Tech. My question is, if community college does become free, do you feel as if the value of having an associate's degree will begin to drop? Absolutely not. But, but I think it's a good question. I've, I've been asked this question before. I don't know where this is coming from. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story, or, or I'll give you an example. Uh, there is a, uh, a college in, in New York called City Colleges of New York. And back in the... 40s, 50s, 60s. The City Colleges of New York produced as many Nobel laureates as a lot of Ivy League schools. It was free. But it was considered one of the best universities in the country, one of the best college systems in the country. Nobody thought, well, because you went to the city colleges and it didn't cost you any money, that somehow the education was devalued. Uh, so the issue is, is, is not whether you're, how much money you're paying. The issue is what kind of education is it providing you. And the reputation of the school is going to be determined by when the graduates come out, do they have the skills they need to do the job? And if they do, then employers are going to know it because employers are hungry for well-qualified students. I can't tell you how many businesses I talk to where they say our biggest problem is we can't find enough workers who are trained in this, uh, the fields that we're, uh, that we're searching for. So I, I don't, don't let anybody think that Paying more means a better education. Um, one thing that we do have to think about, and this is where the community colleges uh, can be an outstanding bridge, is making sure that we're reaching out to businesses and finding out what do they need for the positions that they're hiring and having those businesses help community colleges design training programs and departments to serve those needs. And we're seeing a lot more work done by community colleges on that front. And I've, Ivy Tech does a great job also with apprentice, apprenticeships in partnership with Labor Council. That's another example of uh, smart education. Turns out the average apprentice gets a $50,000 starting salary once they get out of apprenticeship on average across the country. So we're doing a lot to encourage schools to expand apprenticeships and partnerships. 
But uh, yeah, don't 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 think uh, paying more is better. Paying less is better. <laughs> I uh, I'm always looking for a deal. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Yes, right there. Yeah, hold. Mike's coming right there. Yes, my name is Amy Saxton. Hold on, Amy. Oh, sure. Here we go. Thank you. My name is Amy Saxton, and my question is: I pay for my daughter's college. I'm now saving for my grandchildren's college with a 529 plan. Right. Do you see any changes that might impact me as I go into retirement? You know, we we initially looked at changing the 529 plan. Um, and the reason is that I have 529s for both Malia and Sasha. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, 529 is basically a, a savings account that you can put in tax-free up to a certain amount uh, for savings for your, your child's college. Um, the problem is when you looked at the statistics, the folks who used them most were folks who were a little more on the high end a lot of people couldn't use them because they just weren't generating enough savings to be able to take advantage of the benefit. And so our thinking was you could save money by eliminating the 529 and shifting it into some other loan programs that would be more broadly based. Um, but I think enough people, and, and we were going to hold harmless folks like you or me who already have money in 529, so it wasn't as if... Uh, Suddenly, you had to start paying taxes on it. But just going forward, we were going to change it. Uh, I'll be honest with you. There were enough people who already were utilizing 529s that they started feeling as if, well, you know, changing like this in midstream, even if I'm not affected right now, I, I like the program. It wasn't worth it for us to eliminate it. Uh, the savings weren't that great. So we actually, based on response, changed our mind and are going to be paying for the two years of free community college with other sources, including some of the tax loopholes that we're closing. So short answer to your question is 529s will not change at this point. OK. Uh, got a gentleman here who really has a question right here. He's, he's, he was waving and everything. This is going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. Uh, no, that's right. What's My name is Eddie White with the Indiana Pacers. Oh, good to, good to talk to you, man. Basketball is really important in this state. You know, we have this saying, in 49 states, it's just basketball, but this is Indiana. <laughs> Years ago, on a radio show, you told me that when I asked you about your game, you said you were a poor man's Tayshawn Prince. Where is your game today? And one more thing, Tamika Ketching says she's ready one-on-one -on -one anytime you want. All right. Well, let me make a couple of points here. Uh, first of all, I love Tamika. Uh, she refereed the game we played in Kokomo, so she was a witness to my domination <laughs> on the court. Um, but when it comes to uh, me playing her one-on-one -on -one at this point, I'm not sure, because uh, I'll be honest with you, my game's a little broke. <laughs> I've been a little busy. And, and, and what happens is that... Uh, so the risk-reward ratio starts shifting. Like the chances of uh, an Achilles tear or an ACL injury uh, are in is increasing each month. And then the satisfaction that I get from playing diminishes because I'm so bad. <laughs> and so I think, uh, I think golf, <laughs> likelihood of injury much lower. But uh, I still love the game. I, I still love the game. And, and uh, you, you know, uh, this is a good time for me to give a shout out to the NBA. Uh, you know, Mayor Ballard mentioned the work that he's doing with my brother's keepers. Uh, and, and this is something that we initiated uh, in response to all the negative news that we were hearing about young African Amer American men and Latino men and their interactions with police. and. We said, all right, there are a whole bunch of issues that we have to deal with on the criminal justice side, but we have to have an affirmative agenda to make sure that young people feel hope and opportunity and pathways. And so um, 
so the idea of My Brother's Keepers is, is that we are working with both the private sector and the public sector all across the country uh, on mentorship programs. Uh, you know, the mayor's talking to folks about doing a zero to three program because we know that if you invest early in young people, they are much more likely to su succeed in school. Uh, we know that there's certain points in time where kids are more likely to drop out or more likely to get in, in trouble with the criminal justice system and so figuring out interventions. Uh, we know that if they're reading at grade level in the third grade, then they're much more likely to graduate, so making sure that we're really concentrating on reading skills at that level. And uh, the, the, the interest and involvement has surprised even me. People have been really generous uh, and, and stepped up to the plate. Uh, and the NBA is participating. Some of you who've been watching the games may have seen some of the ads uh, of uh, some of the players uh, talking directly to the TV screen and saying to young people, uh, they matter. Uh, and so I just want to commend them for uh, the great th uh, work they're doing uh, on that front. Commissioner Silver has been very good on it. So we appreciate it. All righty. Let's see. Young lady way in the back. Right there. Yeah, you. Hold on one second, though. Wait for the mic to come. Hi. Oh, oh I hold it. Okay, I just want to get this right, so I'm going to read it off. Hi, my, okay. name, my name is Isabel Keller. And but you I'm don't have to talk that fast. Oh, okay, I'll go slowly. Okay. I'm sorry. You're I'm just kind of nervous. Yeah. Okay. A little bit. Yeah. Um, my name is Isabel Keller, and I'm a jun the junior class president at my high school, and I'm co-chairing a bipartisan event at my school next year to help engage high school students in our political process. What advice do you have in helping attract high school students and get them more engaged like in our country's politics? That's great. See, I love young leaders like this. They're juniors in high school taking an interest. Make sure one of our volunteers gets, <clears throat> what's your name again? Isabel? Okay. Let, let's get Isabel's uh, you know, email, and, and uh, maybe I'll send her a note for the, uh, to kick off the, the event next year. But the, uh, um, one, of, one of the big challenges we have in this country is the lack of civic engagement. The, the, the lack of participation. In the last election, only about a third of people who were eligible to vote voted. A third. And, you know, you have elections that, that take place, for example, in Ukraine where they're in the middle of a war and their participation rates are 60%. And here, with all the blessings that we've got, the notion that only a a third of us would vote that are eligible doesn't make any sense. And, and so it starts at a young age. And, and I think the most important thing is uh, in, in any bipartisan event like that is to help young people understand that politics is not some sideshow in Washington. It's not some cable chatter yakking, arguing. It's how we together as a community make decisions about our priorities. What do we think is important? You know, when you're in a junior in high school, if you're like Malia, if, if you decide you and your friends are going out, uh, you got to make all kinds of decisions about where we're going to eat and what movie do you want to see and you guys take votes and you're trying to figure out maybe one of your friends doesn't have enough money and you know, are we going to chip in to help? Uh, make sure she can go too, and well, the same thing is true for a country. We got to make priorities. We got to make decisions. You know, are we going to invest in schools? Are we going to make sure that when you graduate, you can afford to go to college? Are we going to make sure that we're investing in the research that creates new medicines that will help cure cancer or Parkinson's disease? Are we going to make sure that we're treating our veterans? Uh, the way they need to be treated when they come home. How are we going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for that? Are we going to make sure that we're passing on uh, an environment that, with clean air and clean water? And, and 
how are we going to do that? And how are we going to balance that with making sure that we're growing an economy so when you graduate from college, there's a job for you? Well, those are all the things that, that politics determines. So, so I think more than anything, just helping young people understand that this stuff matters to them and that government is not something separate from you. It is you. In a democracy, it's you that makes these decisions. Um, and then making sure you got good pizza at the event <laughs> is also important. <laughs> All right. Uh, who's next? Young man right here. Right here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hi, hi um, I am Mark. Oh, first I want to say thank you for all the things you're doing and the things that you're going to do for our nation. Secondly, uh, thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Mark Kelly. I'm actually currently the president of the ASAP organization. And my question is, what, what is the, uh, uh, the criteria and the requirements for this plan that you're trying to propose? Uh, for which plan? Uh, for two years oh. free of college, yes. The, uh, the idea would be that you would have to maintain at least a 2.5 average. So uh, we're not going to, I mean, there's no such thing as a completely free lunch. We want to reward people who are making the effort. Because one of the problems we have when it comes to college educations is that young people aren't graduating fast enough. They're dragging things out too long. And that just adds costs. And even if they you know, are taking out loans, so you know, it, it's technically they're paying for it, the problem is, is that the more expensive it gets, the less likely it may be that they can pay it back. So what we're saying is you've got to earn it. You've got to, you've got to have a 2.5 average. You've got to you know, maintain attendance. You've got to stay on a schedule and have a game plan at the front end so that you graduate on time. And obviously, there'd be you know, special circumstances like illness or what have you. But the, the, the point is, this is not you get two years of free goofing off. This is to help you achieve your goals. But that means that you have to put in the effort. All right, so that would be the main criteria. Um, all right. Yes, right here. Hold on a second. Mike's coming. My name is Christy Lee Vickers. I am an OIF veteran from the U.S. Army, and I'm also the president of the Ivy Tech Collegiate Veterans Organization. I'm at. Hey, what branch were you in? I was in the Army, and I was a mechanic. Army strong. Whoa. All right. Now, my question is, veterans get to use the GI Bill. They also get voc rehab if they are underemployed or if they use their GI Bill or if their GI Bill, if they were a Cold War veteran, they never got that. Right. How does this affect a veteran's use of education? Because veterans today are dealing with unemployment rates higher than other people. They are dealing with unemployment altogether. And what's really important is getting a veteran who is dealing with post-traumatic stress or other problems to get an education and have people who understand the fact that they have issues, but at the same time, they have benefits that they've earned and they've paid for through blood and tears. Right. Well, first of all, thank you for your service. We're proud of you. Um, <laughs> for those who qualify under the post 9-11 GI Bill, you're already supposed to be getting the benefits that you have earned. And, uh, and, and so nothing would change about that program. As you point out, it's not just uh, college tuition, though, that is often a burden on our veterans. So I am very proud of the fact that I have increased veterans funding more than any administration since I've been in office. And a lot of it is focused on some of the challenges that you talk about. For example, um, we made it much easier for veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder to qualify under disability claims. 
we expanded significantly the number of mental health uh, facilities that were available. We set up, for example, special uh, programs for women veterans because they've got different medical needs through the, the VA uh, system. Another example that's really important is we've been working with states and local governments around issues of licensing. So you said you were a mechanic. You know, there may be, in a lot of states, licensing requirements for you to be a mechanic or to be uh, uh, EMS uh, officer or uh, to be a nurse. And what we were finding was is that, I, I still remember I had a conversation with a guy up in Minnesota. This is when I first came into office. We're at a little diner sitting down. He had just come back from Iraq. You know, he, he had two or three tours in Iraq. And you can imagine what an emergency medic in Iraq is dealing with in 2006 or 2007. He decided he wanted to make a career as a nurse. He was having to come back and he was having to start with Nursing 101. I mean, he had to start from scratch. As if he didn't have this incredible wealth of experience and skill. And so we set out to work with state legislators and cities and others that oftentimes are responsible for licensing to say there's got to be transferability and credit for the incredible work that veterans do on the job so that they don't have to start all over again and take a whole bunch of new classes just to get certified on stuff they already know how to do. And, and that's been really helpful as well. The, the key now is to get more employers to recognize the skills of our veterans. So Michelle uh, and Jill Biden, through their Joining Forces program, have been able to recruit companies all across the country, you know, major corporations like Honeywell, smaller companies, to not just do job fairs, but make concrete commitments. We are going to hire a certain number of veterans, a certain number of military spouses, and hundreds of thousands of folks have come through these programs. The challenge that we've still got is that uh, we've got to find ways for veterans to upgrade their skills uh, through this process. And that's where things like apprenticeships and, and uh, so, so that folks aren't just getting hired at the bottom rungs, but have the opportunity to maybe come in at a higher wage and a higher salary. So we've got to tie together the education process with the hiring process. Right. Sure. Right. Being a veteran for serving, for having your disability training, for being a spouse, and so on. And in Indiana, there is a bill that they're trying to pass this bill to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for veterans to get hired. And they're trying to make it more easy for
not just veterans, but their families make, are incredible. Uh, and yeah, I'm proud to say that we do much better now than we did in the past. I mean, when you read about the Vietnam era, it's just heartbreaking uh, how veterans were treated uh, when they came home. I think we as a society, and this has been bipartisan, have really uh, improved, but we still have a lot more work to do. So the, the, the veterans' health system, for example, is far better now than it was 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, demonstrably better. But as we saw, remember, in Phoenix, there's still situations where the wait times are too long. Veterans are really satisfied once they get in the system, but getting the initial appointment is often too tough. There's too much bureaucracy. There's too much red tape. So we have to just constantly keep at this and constantly keep improving it. And as we end, you know, we've now ended both the Iraq War and the Afghan War. We got, we got millions of people in, in terms of the combat role. You know, we, we've got hundreds of thousands of folks who are coming home, and, and they, they're going to need help uh, making this transition. Uh, and, and, and obviously, we still have folks in harm's way now dealing with ISIL, as well as helping to train both Iraqi and Afghan armies. And, you know, they're going to need help as well. And they're still on rotations. Their families are still missing them, and, you know, they're missing birthdays and soccer games. And, it's a big sacrifice. So thanks for the question and thanks for your service. All right. We got a gentleman. Let's see. This is a good good bunch to choose from. Uh, he's got a veteran's is he, he's got a veteran's hat on, which makes me more biased towards him. This is an example of your uh, but uh, the are you gonna ask another veteran's question? Okay, right here. Mr. President, thank you for coming and thanks for taking my question. I'm Chris Bowen. I'm the student government president here. And I, so I represent the students here in the central region of Indiana for Ivy Tech. And something we could use right away is a tax credit for books. It's, they're just, the costs on the books are just running away. We need somebody, somebody to do you know, some help in that area. And then the same thing with advisors. We really need some advisors that know the classes that we need to look at the skills that we already have in our life and say, hey, have you thought about looking at approach in a different way. And so we really need some help from, from the federal government in those areas. I think, I, I think that's a great point. First of all, the, uh, I, I should have mentioned at the outset, when Michelle and I got out of, when we got married, uh, in addition to uh, the bonds of love, uh, we had the bonds of debt. We, uh, our, our, our net worth was negative because uh, we had all these student loans. And, and basically, for the first 10 years of our marriage, uh, we paid more in student loan repayment than we did on our mortgage. Um, and since we both went to law school, we both remember well the cost of books. And for those, and then I taught in the law school, so I remember having to sign books. I, I actually cheated a little bit and put together these syllabi that, where I'd Xerox stuff off and they could get a packet and it was a lot cheaper for folks. Um, but that's not always possible. Uh, but I will say, no, nothing's worse than when a professor assigns their own book. Because then you know they're getting over. Um, but, but, you know, the book costs are enormous. Uh, they're real. Now, one of the advantages of the two-year uh, free college tuition plan, that doesn't include room and board and books. But what that does then is it frees up your ability to use Pell Grants or other programs for books, right? So it would, it would relieve some of those costs and living expenses and transportation and all that stuff. Um, so school still wouldn't be perfectly free, but you would now have the budget to manage that. Um, with respect to advisors, I think this is a great point. We're actually starting at the high school level. Michelle just had uh, an event uh, to celebrate counselors, uh, and she had uh, Connie Britton, remember she played a counselor in uh, Friday Night Lights? You all watch that show? That was a good show. Um, 
so she came to, to speak, but, but it was celebrating the role of counselors in high schools. But the same is true in community colleges with advisors. A, a lot of young people have a general idea of what they want to do, but don't always know the path to get there. Don't know what the requirements are. Don't know what classes they should be taking. And one of the big problems that drives up college costs is young people start down one path, they get about halfway through it, they realize actually, you know, that's the thing I'm more interested in over there. They switch, but all those credits that they took now are wasted, and they've got to start all over again, and that extends greatly the, the amount of time that it takes to graduate. So having more counselors and investors on the front end end up being a good investment for the system overall. Um, now, I, I haven't talked to your president here in, uh, about how uh, schools are currently budgeting uh, advisors, uh, but certainly this is something that we are interested in and we are, we're going to want to partner with uh, community colleges and public universities as well as with high schools to see what more work we can do on that front. All right, so good suggestions. That's why you got elected president. Absolutely. All right. Uh, it's, a, it's a young lady's turn, right here, right in the middle. You, yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Dana Phillips with Nathaniel Lee and Lee and Fairman. And my question is, with the focus being on two-year co community colleges right now, what focus does your administration have for historically black colleges and universities for students outside of Indiana where they may choose to attend these institutions with such uh, dire straits that many of them are facing right now? Well, you know, we, we have some outstanding historically black colleges and universities. We've, we've got some universities that historically serve uh, primarily uh, Latino students um, who, who do a great job as well. Many of those uh, schools, because of their critical role in serving underrepresented communities, under federal legislation get additional uh, dollars to help with infrastructure and maintain uh, you know, their, their faculties and so forth. Um, but many of the problems that those schools face are also the ones that every other school faces, which is rising tuition, students taking out too much debt, graduation rates that are too low. Uh, and so we're working with them on this common set of problems. Now I will say this. Uh, there are some historically black colleges and universities that are not doing a good job with graduation rates. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're saying to schools of all stripes that we're going to develop some uh, measures so that parents and students can know ahead of time how those schools are performing so that we can increase consumer education. Because what I don't want to do is to have the federal government pay for a Pell Grant or student loans, and you go to a school where they're taking that money, you're getting into debt, but your graduation rate's low, which means you may end up leaving without a degree you now are on the hook for this debt. If you can't pay it, then taxpayers have to pay for it. That's a problem. So uh, you know, what we're doing is those schools that are doing outstanding jobs serving underrepresented communities, we're going to give them some extra help. Schools that are not doing a good job, we're saying to them, we're going to give you the, the training to get better, but at a certain point, if you don't get better, we're going to start advertising the fact that, you know, your graduation rates are too low. I mean, we've got to have some accountability in this overall process. All right? Good. Gentleman right here. And there you go. In that spiffy gray, gray jacket. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Frank Short, and I have a question. You've been our leader for six years. You have two years left. What would be your number one priority, and what could we... Is hardworking Hoosiers help you to do to accomplish that? I appreciate that. Um, 
You know, my, my number one priority is to make sure that the American people's wages and, and incomes are going up. Since right now the stock market's gone up, corporate profits are at an all-time high. Corporate balance sheets have never been better in history. That's not, in, that's, that's not according to me. That's according to Bloomberg and, and, and Fortune magazine, not, not publications that generally are my big promoters. Um, so, so they're doing well. And the question now is, how do the folks who work in those companies, how do we get them more income and more wages? Now, that can't happen if the economy doesn't grow. So first and foremost, we've got to keep this growth going. And one, one of the worries that we're going to have this year, the economy is doing well. The problem is, overseas, the economies aren't doing so well. Europe's not doing well. Uh, China is slowing down because they're transitioning. And so that's having an, some impact on our exports. So if we want to keep the progress that we'll, that's going on right now, the best thing we can do is to make the investments that I talked about in the State of the Union to create more growth and more demand here in the United States. I'll be very specific. This is something that you can help on. Infrastructure. We know that we've got about $2 trillion worth of deferred maintenance we need to do in this country. Bridges that are unsafe, sewer mains that are bursting, uh, airports that are out of date. We've got an air traffic control system that doesn't take advantage of new technologies. If we put in place a new state-of-the-art air traffic control system, it's estimated that airlines could save 30 percent on their fuel costs because they wouldn't be uh, hovering around trying to wait to land. That means 30 percent less pollution from fuel. It means we could cut delays by about 30 percent which I know everybody here who's flown lately would really appreciate. It'd be good for business. You know, so, so, and the good thing about infrastructure is you can't export those jobs. They have to be done here by American workers. And so then those American workers have more money in their pocket. And then they go to the restaurant nearby. And then suddenly the restaurant's doing a little bit better. And so they hire a couple more shifts. And you get this virtuous cycle. So, and, and traditionally that's been a bipartisan issue. So if we can get uh, Republican representatives and senators and Democratic representatives and senators here in Indiana, if you guys can push them to say, let's go ahead and move forward on an infrastructure program. I know the mayor wouldn't mind doing it, right? Uh, and, and convince them that keeps the economy growing overall. But then there are also some things that you know, I want to do more directly for middle class families, and that has to do with this tax system. Um, I, I, as I mentioned before, I, you know, there was a young woman I talked about at the, at the State of the Union, wonderful family, uh, the Earlers, two little boys. Not yet, uh, one of them's school age, one of them's uh, still too young and in preschool. Th th their child care is more than tuition at the University of Minnesota, or at least close. We are the only advanced nation on earth that does not provide support to families when their kids are really young and doesn't invest in making sure that our child care system uh, works the way it should. So I put forward an initiative that says let's consolidate and make more, uh, more helpful a tax credit for child care. Let's, let's uh, boost the quality of child care so that parents have confidence when they're putting their kids someplace that, you know, the teachers there are trained and they're getting good early childhood education. Let's get more slots. Um, that's something that just is concretely helping families right now. 
And, and, and by the way, it's not just uh, the poor family that has trouble here. There are a lot of folks who we'd all consider middle class who have the same problem. I mean, it's, 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 it's just hard, especially now that the typical middle class family, they got two, two breadwinners. Folks both have to work in order to succeed. And we know how to do this. My grandfather, when he went away to war, uh, fighting Patton's army in Europe, my grandmother stayed home. She was uh, Rosie the Riveter. You know, she was working on a, uh, uh, an assembly line for uh, bombers. And this country provided child care because they knew it was, a, it was a necessity. If you were going to have women working in the workforce, somebody had to look after those kids. So it's not as if we don't have any experience doing this. We just don't do a good job. Um, paid sick leave is another good example. We got 43 million Americans who don't have paid sick leave. You think about that. Again, we're like the only country in the industrialized world that does not provi <laughs> provide paid sick leave. Well, that's money out of people's pockets. People will get sick. And, and the idea that in a society like ours, we would force people to choose between leaving uh, a chick's uh, sick child at home, for example, or giving up a day's pay. That doesn't make any sense. That's uh, so. So uh, the the way Hoosiers can help, the way folks all across America can help, is is to let your members of Congress know these things are important. And if, as I said before, Republicans in Congress, Mitch McConnell and John Boehner and the leadership there, if they disagree with how I'm paying for a bigger child care tax credit, if they disagree with how I plan to pay for infrastructure, if they don't want to raise uh, you know, or, or close loopholes on the top 1% uh, or, you know, go after some of these loopholes that uh, send profits overseas. If they don't want to do it that way, then they should show me another way. But, but your voice letting them know this is important, not because it's partisan, but because it's the right thing to do for America. If they hear that from enough people, then that's going to make a difference. But it goes back to what that young lady asked me about Isabel, right? See, I got a good memory. <laughs> I'm not getting too old. The, uh, it, it goes back to what Isabel's saying. Our system only works when people are involved. When people are involved and informed and taking the time to ask questions and, and let their opinions be known, uh, then ultimately the government will respond. But if only a third of the people are saying anything, the government doesn't respond. And you get the government that uh, we've seen in Washington lately, which is unresponsive and it's not doing enough. So, so people have to get involved and you've got to be informed. Um, and if, if, if we are, then I am so optimistic about this country. I, the, the reason we've gotten out of this recession over the last six years is in part, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and brag a little bit, we made some good decisions. We made the decision to save the auto industry. We made the decision to stabilize the financial system. We made the decision to, to help uh, local governments keep their teachers on, on the payroll and, and not lay them off. We, we made a bunch of decisions to do infrastructure spending. And, and all that helped lift us out of the, re the, 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 the recession we're in. But the main reason was because people worked hard in the private sector and small businesses. and They, they tightened their belts and they made sacrifices and they paid down debt and they dug themselves out of holes. The resilience and the grit and, and the basic decency of the American people and, and our willingness to work hard and our innovation, our willingness to take risks, it puts us in such a good position. I travel all around the world. I, I know the economies of every country in the world. I know their problems. I know their, their um, advantages. You know, people talk about China, and they talk about Germany, and they talk about India. Nobody's got better cards than we do.
if we make good decisions together. Uh, and, and, you know, somebody once said about America, uh, we always end up doing the right thing after we've uh, tried everything else. <laughs> and, and, and I'm hoping that, you know, uh, that uh, we don't have to try every th other thing before we do the right thing right now to help middle class families get ahead. If we do that, the economy is going to be stronger, businesses are going to do better, consumers are going to be more confident, we'll sell more goods overseas, our kids will have the kind of future we want for them. That's what I'm going to be working on for the next two years. I hope you help with. All right. Thank you, everybody.